quite a number of years, I've been going through this stupid nightmare for quite a long time. I actually told the New York Times, um, Yale took away my 20s, but I'll give them my 30s. Uh, I'm cognizant of how long this lawsuit can take as it makes its way through the court system, but I will fight this till the bitter end. Okay, we're joined today by, hopefully I don't mangle it, Saif Khan. How are you doing? Hi, good Pretty good. Good morning to you, Eric. How are you? Good morning. Now, you, um, I've been introduced to your story from a close friend of mine, Nate the Lawyer, and he's discussed some of the events that have gone on between you, um, charges and Yale and other things. I just kind of wanted to step back and go through the whole story because I've not really followed all of the details. So I'm going to be learning with you as right. we go. Now, of course. we're going to go way back because your family history and upbringing sounds very fascinating. One, you were not born here in the States. Where were you born? Yeah, so... Ethnically, uh, originally, uh, I'm from Afghanistan. I was born around uh, the border of Afghanistan, Pakistan, in a nearby refugee camp in Pakistan. It was built and maintained and, you know, provided for by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, and uh, spent a couple of years there, early life. And the when was this? So this would be early 90s. I was born in 93. 93. Okay. So this is... Right. Um, well, let me see. Soviet Union had probably already left Afghanistan at that point? Yeah. So the Union, the Soviets had left in 89. They had installed uh, uh, their own, I guess, regime uh, uh, to replace them. And that guy, Najibullah, lasted for about three years or so. And then he was killed, hanged in a street corner, and everything went awry. Uh, there was a civil war that broke out, and there were many other uh, factions, including the Mujahideen, who had you know, defeated the Soviets, and uh, many people, just warlords, vying for power. Um, so, so that's the time period we're talking about around my birth. Okay, and... Now, was bin Laden still um, traveling in and out in Al-Qaeda at that time? Because I know he helped us against the Soviet Union. A lot of people don't realize yeah. that, that we trained bin Laden and, and right. worked with so, him. I think, uh, so I'm not very well versed in his specific history. He definitely had a lot of his people in Afghanistan. And he was uh, spending his time between Sudan and uh, uh, leading up to the 1998 uh, uh, bombing, because uh, Bin Laden didn't just do 9-11. He did quite a few other um, attacks against America. Um, like he, the cold. He was, and... Yeah, he, he was international. So I I don't know if he went to Afghanistan for vacations, but he was there in and out. I, I don't think even the CIA exactly knew where he was. Okay, so... Um... Your family and, and you were at a refugee camp, though. So, right. what, what happened with your family? Were they on the wrong side of the government at the time? What? Well, so so on one hand, um, my family is you know, they're, they're business minded. They're they're not gonna stick around when there's rockets being fired around, uh, and uh, there was just people get caught up the average folks just get caught up in stupid things um my grandparents had bought uh uh, uh wine cups uh, they they considered it as juice glasses they didn't realize my grandpa couldn't read the uh, what it said on the on the box mm -hmm. that this is you know for consumption of wine and such uh he just saw it as like pretty colorful liquid and you know cool looking glass that's that has a stem and you know it's different from you know drinking cups and so on and so he had bought a lot of those from china and uh, the taliban or somebody tipped off 
you know, one of the factions uh, and, and the Taliban sent death threats saying, you know, if we see anybody in the morning, uh, we're going to shoot you all. And uh, it was based on, you know, accusation of, of bootlegging and, and, and uh, providing uh, paraphernalia for alcohol consumption. And so those were the circumstances that led to just escaping. But overall, it was, you know, a, a big exodus in general. I think it was one of the biggest in human history, uh, certainly top 10, uh, where just millions of people just escaped the war. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after you staying in Pakistan, where did you go from there? Yeah, so I was, you know, we were in Pakistan, uh, the camp and nearby towns and so on. And uh, I spent my first 16 years there. So in a I camp? Guess, Matt, Matt, uh, no, no. And um, most of it was in the nearby town, uh, a few kilometers, a few miles away from the camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess mathematically, I've spent more than 50% of my time in that region. Okay, interesting. Now, um, your English is fantastic. Did you grow Thank up you. learning English or? So they, they, they taught us the basics like ABCs and, you know, uh, small things like nouns, verbs, objects, and so on. But nobody spoke English. Nobody had the command over the language. Um, uh, and not, not to sound, you know, arrogant, but I just largely taught myself. Uh, I'm precocious. I'm curious. And I just experiment and I will, you know, take the time to, to learn something to, if, if I realize that X requires Y effort, I will put in the Y effort. And so I greatly appreciate the versatility and all the plethora of, um, I, I, I tease, uh, French friends, uh, you know, people from France who either at Yale or I just meet them in New York often, uh, I tell them, you know, the French language is not the lingua franca. And, uh, and so the English language is something that I've spent a considerable amount of effort in. How did you learn it? I mean, not to sidetrack it's, right. it. I, I think it would be interesting to people if it's self doubt Was it from like watching pop culture or listening essentially essentially consuming it that way um uh the, the the joke answer i give people is oh yeah i i picked up english and, and fixed my accent uh by watching charlie chaplin movies mm. and so unfortunately hippie younger folks just don't know charlie chaplin and so they're like what um and it's i have to tell them the joke that it's a silent movie there was no <laughs> Um, but at the end of the day, it was just books, cartoons, movies. So essentially just consuming Western, uh, uh, productivity, uh, cultural outputs. Now, would you, I'm, I'm curious, would you watch it with subtitles so you could kind of get a, a flow and, and, and hear the words? Because I mean, how I understand getting in context, obviously. Right. So, so, so most, most of it was, uh, uh, from, um, uh, like just books, like I had the fourth Harry Potter book, mm -hmm. but none of the others. And, and it was just largely, um, hand me down stuff that, you know, people in the first world throw away as trash and it just ends up in like landfills, but a lot of them end up just in third world countries. So clothing, I had a game boy, you mm -hmm. know, the stuff didn't work on the game boy, it, you know, like the backlight did not work. The, um, uh, the, the, the games would not save. So I had this weird gaming with the, with the Pokemon where, you know, I, every time you turn it off, there would, you know, and later on, I realized uh, when I grew up that it was a ROM issue, but as a kid, I didn't know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. It was just a lot of like enemy down stuff, but enough crumbs, well, a little more than crumbs for me to pick up a uh, uh, cultural zeitgeist. Uh, of the United States, but I guess just temporally delayed, like I had dial up in 2006 and, you know, I guess most of America had moved away from dial up by then. Um, and so I just, you know, um, I just having dial up and access to Wikipedia and just the ability to read online, um, you know, it, there was 
feedback mechanism between learning technology and learning English. And the more I learned one, the more it helped with the other. And so, yeah. Okay, now learning technology and learning English. So I, I'm getting a vibe, like when you said I learned later that it was ROM, that perhaps you are more involved with the computer industry or programming or something of that sort. Am I too far off? So, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess I, I've been considered by many as a polymath. So I, uh, I, I studied neuroscience in college. Uh, however, I am uh, comfortable with uh, uh, tinkering with all sorts of stuff. Um, I read uh, neuroscience papers for fun or law uh, uh, papers. Uh, the other day, I was at the Rand Corporation on a specific uh, uh, a symposium related to highly technical legal matters. Uh, I enjoy quantum mechanics. Um, and so I will delve into, I don't shy away from, I guess, any field. I, I, I'm not married to any specific career trajectory or, you know, computers. They're just tools that just help with other tools. Um, yeah. You work with AI at all? AI? Artificial intelligence? So, so. So at around 2010, uh, uh, I, I had done a very, I was a, uh, like 15, 16 years old. Um, and this was my first year outside PAC Center. I, I had gone to the UAE. Um, I was building my own little chess engine. So uh, uh, in some ways, a very dumb AI, but essentially an algorithm that does an A-B testing for move selection for um, uh, just playing chess. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. It was a very basic, useless thing. Um, uh, I, I've been following the world of AI for about the same amount of time, about, I guess, 13-ish years, uh, largely from the uh, uh, applying AI to specific uh, tasks like chess. Uh, uh, I've tinkered around with it, but not as deeply as I would like not to the level where I'm taking ML courses. Uh, so, so CS is not, computer science is not my um, strongest mm -hmm. suit, but um, it's something I'm fascinated about. Okay, so what took you to the UAE? So, so PAC, the reason we went to Pakistan in the original place was just, you know, safety. Uh, and that's why you go to a refugee camp to seek refuge. Um, and Pakistan became... Untenuous. It just became a, a horrible place. It, it's been downhill since you know early mid two thousands and so on, and um, uh, we started getting death threats and 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 our family. Uh, uh, you know, because I was born, I guess, as a as an undocumented kid in Pakistan, um, and so there there were just the police wouldn't you know support you or help you. Uh, they're not on your side. And uh, uh, just society itself was not very accepting. And so it allowed a lot of bad actors to abuse that. And, you know, because there's a vulnerable uh, person that just can't do anything. And so there were quite a number of kidnappings and so on around us in our community. And so my, my dad, uh, he's pretty smart. Uh, he, he, in the same way that he had managed to get us out of the camp and get to the nearby, um, town. Similarly, he got us to the UAE, uh, to Ajman, which is uh, about an hour and a half uh, away from uh, Dubai. And so uh, uh, we, we ended up there and I did two years of my high schooling there. Interesting. So when you say Pakistan is untenable, and I'm not familiar, you know, I only have what's sure. kind of thrown in the press and I don't trust half of it anyway. Yeah. Um, was this due to an influx of Taliban influence in Pakistan, or would I be misinterpreting that? And was your family situation partly religious in some way or shape or form? Um, so it's fascinating how the, I guess, the macro and the micro clasp together and meet in the middle and create uh, cultural and incentive structures that, you know, push people in or out or so on. Um, on a macro scale, I guess Pakistan was, you know, reeling from 
America's involvement in Afghanistan because, uh, and I'm like just painting with broad strokes, um, when, with Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, uh, America's operation in Afghanistan, a lot of the Taliban did start seeking safe havens in Pakistan. The border is quite porous. Um, and so I guess there was a lot of spillover uh, uh, back then as it was for decades. Um, and uh, just military involvement and other large scale stuff with ISI uh, that just, you know, uh, things can't be necessarily contained. That's, I guess, largely the issue with uh, disorganized uh, par paramilitaries uh, that's, you know, not state sanctioned and essentially run by uh, intelligence agencies. They go out of control, especially when you imbue them with fervor that is, um, I guess, religious, uh, goes beyond mere nationalism, because um, nationalism is contained, but like religious violence is surprisingly not contained, uh, and hence its effects and individuals tend to be uh, crazy. Um, and so on the lower level, uh, the day-to-day -day folks, people, um, Pakistan's economy went down the hill. Pakistan's um, uh, uh, future prospects in every aspect was just deteriorating rapidly, uh, largely because of the top-down bad governance, uh, but also just the culture just wasn't very, you know, uh, focused on education. Here I am, you know, uh, trying to learn uh, English and a lot of my peers weren't so enthusiastic about learning. Mm -hmm. Well, they might not have been and enthusiastic of... about English or Americans either, from what I understand. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, it's, yes, the anti-America rhetoric ran deep, like severely deep to completely irrational levels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Which is... Some of it is earned. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, say that we're, we're innocent as can be. America moves around and does a lot of things and that, that can cause strife. Right. So I'm, I'm not trying to criticize uh, on that front necessarily. Now, so you managed to get to UAE um, with right. your family. And right. that's an interesting place from what I've read and seen like it, it's very pretty um a <laughs> lot of money there but there there may be a, a darker tinge that's going on underneath as well is that something that you saw or were exposed to because i imagine as um, a refugee i you know yeah i i i honestly had a horrible time in the uae i did not like the place i still don't like it um the uh stratification at, at and the, the pyramidal structure uh, of the inequality. Um, a lot of folks in the Western hemisphere throw around wealth inequality mm -hmm. uh, willy nilly. Uh, and I largely push back against it because the, the phrase doesn't make good sense. Um, in the UAE, you have pseudo slavery. Uh, it's just some would say uh, actual slavery. slavery. Right. It's just slavery shrouded with, uh, you know, like, little bits here and there and saying like, well, this isn't actually slavery, but it's essentially slavery. Um, and the numbers are horrendous. Uh, I think like UAE has like 23% of its population as women and like 77 ish, uh, is men. And the reason being is that the majority are just workers and these workers are heavily abused, passports taken, um, their wages are stolen from them. Uh, the conditions are horrendous. They die and they have no recourse whatsoever. And it's not just bad for the bottom 60%. It's also pretty bad for the middle class. Mm. And so uh, I, I, I guess I don't want to get my family in trouble because a good chunk of them still live in the UAE. Mm. Um, your audience can surmise all the issues existing. It's a simple Google search way. Uh, it, the fancy building, the concrete buildings, the, they don't excite me. Uh, it's, it's, it's the reason why I didn't go to school there, despite, you know, having the opportunity and scholarships there. 
it's uh, people talk about like ceilings in America, like glass ceilings, which I push back again against. They don't really exist here. In the UAE, there are actual limitations to what you can and cannot do based on who you are, or based on your skin color, based on your mm. ethnic background, and so on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I had heard, and and maybe maybe the proper term is indentured servant. I don't know, but right for, right. for them, but still pretty dark. Um, right. Then okay. So you're in UAE for a couple of years. It sounds like you became an adult in UAE or were pretty close to that if I'm my timeline's going right. Right. Yeah. 16 to 18. Yeah. Okay. So how did you wind up here? Right. So, so I was, you know, uh, achieving clarity. Uh, one thing that I, uh, deeply, deeply care about is just, you know, canceling out the noise and focusing on signal and figuring out what is just junk, what is appropriate, what makes sense, and, and so on, um, to whatever makes sense to me. And um, I just started, you know, connecting the dots between the macro level and the, the little steps one has to take up, uh, you know, like you wake up, well, what do you do? You know, what do you do for this minute? What do you do for these five minutes? Um, uh, I don't get lost in the weeds, the little step-by-step -step stuff, Although they are heavily, heavily important, um, I, I went from the top-down abstract of, well, folks my age go to college, and, and now I'm I'm getting cues from the internet, so I, I I'm learning from folks writing things down, um, but I'm essentially shopping around, and so I'm uh, I'm questioning things and saying like, okay, if if the world is my oyster, then well, where do you go? And so there are these, you know, big pockets of culture and opportunities that exist in different parts. And they're largely disconnected from each other. If you, you know, so I started comparing and shopping between Germany, China, USA, UK, uh, Korea, and then just, you know, figuring out like, well, um, what is the ticket to entry? And so how quickly could I pick up German? So I kept like, okay, five, six months, I could probably pick up good enough German and then improve it over the next few years, um, maybe two years from Mandarin. And then just comparing and contrasting the, uh, the local host cultures and their ability to, to you know, uh, absorb and allow me to, to assimilate and to advance. Um, and uh, simultaneously, I'm also achieving clarity in terms of, well, who am I? What am I doing? Okay, I guess I'm a human and that uh, this is an appropriate thing to do at this age. Uh, Got to go to college. This is generally what people do. Uh, so let me, I guess college costs money. Let me ask you on this because it's, it gets kind of abstract as you're doing right. this. Are, are you literally saying, what do I want to be when I grow up? Was that essentially right. the question? Right. Right. Okay. And so, so I, I, I take the philosophy of it and then break it down to very small steps like, okay, this many hours to study for the SAT, you know, so I take down the abstract and go all the way down to the little steps like, okay, I need this many hours. These are the subjects within the subjects. I need to study this particular thing. And this, this one would get me the most benefit because the past 20 tests have these sorts of patterns of questions showing up. And so, and then you just do it. Okay. So and this so, is, this is where it's actually interesting to hear you on this because we have a huge age sure. difference between us. So, how old are you? Um, I'm 53. Wow. Yes, yeah, so very you, old. You look 45. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's how I was gonna. Um, I'm I'm hearing a lot of things. I'm hearing a lot of attention to the process, the details, and the right. steps. But I'm what I'm not hearing is what what was the goal? What was the overall like? Right. What, what you're you're focusing on all these steps to get you to a process, but it sounds like you really didn't have a destination in mind, but just kind of what would right. be the most attainable, conquerable process. So I'm wondering, what was your actual, what the hell did you want to be? Right. So, so I don't choose goals. I'm outcome independent. So uh, in the sense that I feel that if I relegate myself to uh, 
specific set of goals, I'm severely limiting myself. And you can notice this in the lawsuit. You can notice this in significant parts of my life where um, I actually don't keep goals. Um, they're just frivolous targets that people have. Everything is dynamic. Um, now, of course, I know the direction of things. Um, like, let's say, uh, topic of wealth. Directionally, I know that I should be wealthy. Now, I don't encumber myself with specific numbers because that's just moot. Now, there are, say, mathematical tools that would help saying like, oh, here's the concept of fire and here's the calculator for fire, um, the acronym of fire, financial independence, retire early and say, OK, this is how much you burn per year. And this is a, a mathematical amount that would help sustain that burn rate. Um, and so let's say you burn 100,000 a year. Um, well, you need like about 25 times that so you can you know, fire at 2.5 million. So there are like these mathematical tools that help conceptually help you understand these big topics. Um, but I don't marry myself to 2.5. My goal is to advance in large uh, topics like these. And so in terms of career or things I would like to do, um, Again, I don't want to be a neuroscientist. I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be a, a, a wealthy guy. It's, it's more of, on the abstract sense, where and which things are, are that I find curious and that I have a natural aptitude for, and then which ones have the highest density of you know, uh, advancement and information and knowledge per unit of time. Now, I could dedicate myself to fashion, but uh, I, I believe I'll get very little out of it, uh, even if I spend 10 years in it. But learning quantum mechanics, learning law, learning neuroscience, uh, learning finance, um, those are heavy topics that are replicable and uh, applicable uh, across domains. And they just readily help me and they're concrete. And so, um, yeah, I don't actually have a destination. No, which is, it's interesting. And I, I can see that as being a product of your childhood. And as an example, I grew up and I was a not rich at all. I was a poor kid. I went to schools that had a lot of wealthy kids just by right. where I was geographically located, but not actual family money, if you will. And when I was growing up, I would obtain things that I didn't care about, but I knew that they had a particular value. And I knew that I could trade this thing that I got for another thing that I also probably didn't care about, but would have slightly more value. And through this mechanism, I could eventually get that thing that I want or need, like a car or, or whatever, just by right. trading, 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 trading. And with that, that gave me very little affinity or care for many physical things. They're just, they're just tools to get there. It sounds to me so, that, like that's your life, like your philosophy. That's, that's quite literally is. Yeah, I, I, I call it the buckets of life. So what you just described in terms of tra trading, um, uh, uh, life is a series of trades, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I literally uh, call it the bucket of life where imagine a spigot in a room where there's, you know, one uh, 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 tap where it's like one drop per second and that's time. Mm -hmm. And so you can convert the unit of time into the bucket of money or the bucket of X resource or Y uh, uh, expenditure. And so you keep going around the room, you know, trading time for, say, clothing and trading clothing for, say, other things. And so you constantly are growing and, and time is running out and there's a limited amount. And so then you start giving up a lot of the stuff that you have accumulated to save on time. And so, yeah, it's, it's whether we like it or not, we're playing this game. Uh, and so, um, that gamification allows me to, to I guess, 
not only play it optimally, but surprisingly be detached. So I'm not hedonistic mm. and I can easily disregard uh, consumerism or other uh, stuff that can be black holes where you get stuck in silly stuff that's not a good trade. Mm. So, and we'll get to it, I think, later, but I'm, I'm questioning what gives you the fulfillment because right. you're, you're so process driven in everything that you describe and without a goal that that can kind of get somebody to wander off the um, reservation slightly. And perhaps you have, and, and maybe that's where we're, we're heading to with the trouble that you've mm -hmm. had. Right. And so, so that surprisingly describes me. I, I, uh, I, I wrote my college essay on this, um, the idea of, of just press the button, mm. let's see what happens. And so that curiosity has led me to America and I, it will lead me continuously down the different paths. Um, uh, even within the lawsuit, uh, uh, Part of the reason why folks are enthralled by this, uh, particularly the major news uh, media, is that here are tools that were technically available, but just people haven't, you know, pressed the buttons. And I'm pressing them in specific combinations because that's, according to my calculation, appropriate. And so um, I do this in every uh, part of my life. It's very exhausting because uh, I sometimes take days uh, being stuck on a problem that more people just take the basic definition and understanding of and just roll with that. For me, it's like, well, what does this word mean? How does this work? Okay, so let's get to that because um, essentially, and I gotta be careful, it's YouTube, so terminologies, Always bad. You came to the States and you wind up going to Yale. Uh, that's right. not a slouch school. It's, you know, many people struggle to get into Yale, um, especially to come from outside the country and to get there. It's a very expensive right. proposition. So how did that happen? How did you find your right. way to Yale? So so when I was comparing the opportunities available in various countries, um, as I mentioned, Germany, UK, USA, and Eastern countries, um, I made an Excel sheet. And so uh, there were online lists that, you know, had all these 6,000 plus colleges in America. And then I truncated the list based on whether they provide scholarship opportunities and other criteria that helped me narrow down and focus on target number of schools and then just go to the school's websites, go to Common App and see different experiences and just have a clear idea of what is it that they want? How do you apply? And then um, just in the most efficient manner possible, give them what they want. They want good grade, already have those, cool. They want a nice essay, okay, let's take two weeks to write that down. Um, they, they, they want good SAT scores. Okay. Here's how many hours I need. And so it's just then breaking down of the practical steps required. Um, and then overcoming weird obstacles. I didn't have a credit card. I had a couple of hundred bucks saved in cash on common app. You have to pay like back then, like 60 bucks per college. Um, uh, so they could consider your application. They didn't have waivers. back then, And so I had to find a guy with a credit card give him cash so that I could use his card online and, you know, just other small steps like, well, what if this website is a scam? Is this a really, truly a proposition that a school in this foreign country is willing to do this interaction with me, a 17, 18 year old? Where were you getting the where, cash to pay all this? Did you have a job? Or? Uh, I, 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 I had done summer jobs in Afghanistan and, and so, um, it's just summer, summer jobs. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it was like six, 700, 800, something like that. That's dollars. a lot of money over there. Uh, I thought. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, I had texted, uh, with various folks in Kabul where, uh, 
I just skipped the line and got to like really high paying jobs, uh, high paying being like 700 a month. Right, right. How, how did you do that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm very, I'm curious sure. too, but yeah, right. skipping the so, line. So, I mean, I don't have a resume. Mm -hmm. I don't have a resume. What I do is um, I look at things that are going on. For example, in 2010, there were elections going on in Afghanistan. And so I was like, okay, I guess I could go help them. And it was during the summer. And, you know, I speak good English at that point. And I, I have, I'm literate with computers and so on. And so um, I, you know, talk to, to, talk to this guy who apparently knows this guy who knows the head of elections in the entire country of Afghanistan. And so, and I get the number from him saying like, Hey, I would like to work with this guy. And so I text him just a message saying like, Hey, I am in, I'm in Afghanistan for the summer. Do you have any internship opportunities available anywhere? I would love to. How old know, were you at the time? I, I have like 16, 16? Okay, 17. Yeah. Yeah. And so 16, 17. Yeah. And the guy texts me back saying, oh, wow, you wrote this in perfect grammar. Why didn't you show up to my office tomorrow? And so I show up to his office and then he, he was confused because he thought that, you know, somebody had written the message for me and he was like, whoa, like he realized that I was pretty smart. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, do you want to work for me? I was like, yeah, sure. What do you want me to do? And he was like, why don't you be my executive? intern just working directly with him and so that uh i was immediately given the task of creating reports uh bi-weekly reports to give to election donors which were ambassadors uh, uh from across the world who were in kabul and i got the chance to publicly to them to to just you know condense a ton of organizational information onto a report and then just give it to them. Um, so, and I surprisingly did a good job. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a good chunk of it is just showing up and like, you know, talking to the right people and um, learning the skills required and clarity. Okay. And let me see, 2010, we were very deeply into Afghanistan at the time. And I'm, I'm sure that you had to interact with uh, Americans during this course, right? Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. And so, so, so I, I, I got a bit of uh, inspiration from one American in particular who, who helped me think up more about, uh, you know, pushing towards, to, towards American colleges. And so, yeah, that, that, that helped me a lot because America's involvement in Afghanistan was a, a topic on everybody's mind and that ability to, to, to not have a knee-jerk reaction and then go to the abstract level, the philosophy of like, well, actually what's going on? And then achieving clarity um, rather than immediately jumping on any bandwagon, any idea set by your local community. Because that's how I define laziness mm -hmm. when you just don't think for yourself. Um, so so, so uh, laziness is far more mental than physical. Okay, and was any of this work because I, I, I'm hearing different things and I have a weird background, but sure. um, was any of this work tied in with intelligence? Um, Let's see. Back then, no? no. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. And I mean like literally CIA, um, yeah, DIA. No, no, I, no, no, I, I did uh, uh, attempt to uh, create a uh, military defense contracting company uh, uh, in 2015 and 2016. Um, uh, so, so where I wanted to, you know, government contracts, uh, it was lucrative, um, but no, not, not in my teen years or something. Okay. But possibly in your adult years. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, I mean, there was an attempt I tried, mm -hmm. um, but there were significant limitations. I, I, I actually went to Israel, uh, uh, with, with West Point cadets mm -hmm. and colonels from, uh, who were teachers at West Point. Um, I, I had, uh, been involved in quite a few of them. I actually point blank, just went up to one of the colonels saying like, sir, I got to ask, do you think I could like work pretty high up in the U S military? And he said, Scythe, your problem is that you're way too smart and they will always question you. Mm -hmm. 
they will always wonder whether you are loyal to the United States or not. And and the and the focus was because I already somehow knew a lot of stuff mm-hmm. that trained assets, uh, 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 you know, had, and I had just naturally came to those skills uh, without, I guess, organizational support or training from, you know, any national uh, intelligence. Well, survival skills. Your, your background, right. uh, obviously, if you're right. born in a, in a refugee camp and you have to manipulate your way around different areas, yes. And right. by the way, that's I mean, I, I that's good recruitment grounds for it, intelligence. I mean, as a child, <laughs> I remember stealing food. Mm. That's you know, if people can debate the morality of a child stealing food. Mm-hmm. Um, my argument is, I'm here. I survived. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and that will give a certain aloofness or coldness to your demeanor that, that can trouble, um, people. And so now you get into Yale, great achievement, but one, did you graduate from Yale? I did not. I got kicked out of uh, my senior year. Okay. Okay. So you were going to Yale and you were... In a degree for, um, I think you said neuroscience? Right. Cognitive neuroscience. But I was largely making it up by my own way. Um, Normally, they have a checklist of like, well, here's a major. Here's the classes you can take to fulfill the requirements. Um, uh, One of the cool things about cognitive science and neuroscience was that um, the department head was very flexible. So I just took classes from a plethora of fields like philosophy, neurobiology, computer science, um, taking classes, behavioral economics at the business school. And I even taught a class at the business school um, as a TA, uh, law school, child development psychology, um, primate, uh, uh, and just all sorts of stuff. And I would tell the department head, hey, this is this is related to thinking. And they're like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And so I, I circled the topic of, well, what is thinking? What is learning? And so, again, on the abstract level, you know, going down to the fundamental principles of what makes something a thought and then comparing that between computers and children and primates and humans, adult humans and so on. Okay. Now, while you were working on this degree, though, you kind of got into some trouble. What happened? Right. Yeah. So, so I, you know, with the aloofness and, you know, being on cloud nine and and just having a ton of fun, um, being just a young, uh, high testosterone kid, uh, on campus in, you know, uh, in this big country and, uh, through feedback from others, just handsome as well. Um, I was having a ton of sex. I, I was promiscuous, uh, just having a lot of fun and I turned, you know, one one night just ended up sleeping with a girl that ended up accusing me of rape. And so so Yale then initiated their in, intense and immense um, Kafka-esque bureaucracy and immediately suspended me, immediately initiated deportation proceedings, uh, charged me with criminal conduct uh, every uh, level of uh, 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 felony that they could stick, and and their own internal Title IX procedures. Now you and, said Yale. Yeah. Wouldn't normal law enforcement? This is actually a state crime. I thought. Um, wouldn't normal right. law enforcement be involved? Right. So 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 Yale has over the decades usurped power from the state. Uh, for example, they have agreements between the New Haven Police Department and the Yale Police Department, where the powers imbued by the governor, uh, you know, from we the people uh, of state of Connecticut, um, they're deputized. And so the Yale Police Department uh, have all the constitutional rights that, uh, like, say, arresting somebody or, you know, the probable cause of everything that makes a police officer, a Yale police officer, has those same powers, um, yet they're, you know, hired, promoted, 
inspired and given instructions on what to do and what not to do by the Yale administration. And so it well, is Yale's like a, a town in that sense, or, you know, it's or a very powerful town. Uh, it goes beyond the mere, uh, you know, college town situation where, you know, say in the Midwest, you have a college town with 3000 people and the college is 1500 of those mm -hmm. people. And so the entire economy revolves around the college and it's a ghost town during the mm -hmm. holidays. Um, Yale is like that on the state level of in entire Connecticut. Uh, it's a mid-sized state, but about 4 million or so people. Um, but Yale is the number one employer in the state and the number two employer as well because of the hospital network. Mm -hmm. And um, they have an outsized influence in terms of taxation. Uh, they don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an outsized influence in terms of employees and local politics and local, you know, choosing judges and whatever you name it. And Yale's power extends beyond Connecticut as well into the federal government, into the sure. CIA, into the FBI and uh, SCOTUS. So you so were in Skull and Bones? I rejected them. I, I, I went towards a, a Jewish secret society for my senior year. That was just according to my calculations, um, something that was far more aligned with uh, my uh, perspective. Hmm. Are, are you of a Jewish background? I am oh, not. Okay. I was born and raised Muslim, but but um, uh, culturally and mentally, uh, I deeply connect with Jewish culture. Okay, interesting, interesting. And I, I never want to presume because there are a lot of Christians over there too. You know, there's Christians, there's right. Jews, there, there's um, Muslims and even Muslims. I don't know if you're Sunni or Shia, yeah. but I, I know there's a whole tapestry of people that... Um, we don't understand. Uh, okay, so now you were charged with, I guess, a, I don't know if I have to right. edit that. Um, and I'm guessing you were arrested by the Yale police and you were put on a trial. Now the trial would be, is it at Yale itself or were you tried in a Connecticut courtroom? Right. So. So, so, so they have yet to uh, expand the fiefdom that is Yale into prosecutorial power. Um, they, they, they've been attempting to carve out, you know, uh, a lot of state powers within and, and bring them into their own private uh, powers. Uh, but it was the Yale police who did the arrest warrant, who did mm -hmm. the investigation and all the police were. Uh, but they handed it off to the uh, Connecticut prosecutor's office. Okay, and uh, was it the state or was it a city uh, prosecutor? State, state, state. state. Prosecutor. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if the city has the ability to do that. Okay, so ultimately, you went through a trial, and right. you were found by a jury to be not guilty. Right, that is correct. Okay. And um, it was it was uh, right at the height of uh, Me Too uh, uh, when the trial was ongoing. And uh, I guess I had two simultaneous trials occurring. One was trial by media uh, where I was being trashed by all sorts of publications from the New York Times to LA Times to Huffington Post and BuzzFeed and yada yada. And uh, at the same time, I was fighting for my rights at, at court. Um, and so there were some very difficult decisions to make. Uh, and in retrospect, I believe they were correct, where I had a lot of hard evidence uh, 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 proving innocence, which is a very difficult thing in general to do, uh, to prove the negative that, well, I didn't do it. Uh, and so I was, you know, I had DNA evidence. I had, uh, the, uh, medical, uh, test. I'm, 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 I'm avoiding the, I guess the R word for, mm. for YouTube. Uh, um, I had a grape kit or something or. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 uh, the Yale health had done a grape kit and, uh, uh, there was quite a, a number of other evidences like CCTV camera evidence, um, just card swipe evidence, um, which I had and, um, and it just completely, uh, destroyed the narrative that was not only being pushed by the girl, 
but by the university and by the media. And so what I didn't want to give what that. What was the reason for um, the charge? And I understand this may be speculation, but sure. why did she choose to take this approach? So, so she, she largely had a minor role to play in a lot of this. Uh, the main culprit at the end of the day is the university. Um, what, what occurred was just to, to the best of my knowledge and understanding and piecing things together years later, um, it, it was just largely shame on her part, shame in the sense that, um, again, I was a promiscuous kid on campus and she took a night out on the wild side and, and, um, didn't want her friends to know. And so we actually have text messages the morning after where we discussed with each other that let's just keep this between us. Let's not tell anybody because she wanted a relationship. She thought that by having sex with me, we would get into a relationship. And then she found out that I had, you know, a long distance open relationship girlfriend. And, and, and to me, this was just purely, you know, just sex. And, uh, I also hurt her feelings because we had agreed to, you know, have breakfast the morning after, and I blew her off. Not, not intentionally. I had a cricket game to run to. Um, there was just a lot of things that made her, you know, uh, be ashamed of having had sex. Uh, and that, 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 that shame largely came from her relationship with her friends. And so the morning she had actually gone to Yale Health seeking a uh, uh, plan B for you know, pregnancy. And she had told the nurse that she had consensual sex with her partner uh, and she just was seeking plan B. And, um, but then when she went back to her room and after I had blown her off for breakfast and stuff, uh, uh, her friends came to her room and some of them said, hey, didn't we see you with Saif Khan last night? And, and some of, and she was like, no, 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 I wasn't with him. And, and, and they, they pressured her saying like, well, we saw you, you, you were pretty close with him and touchy feely. And then another girl saw condoms in the trash and said, oh, you had sex with Saif Khan. And then she's like, I didn't do it. She, he did. I didn't have sex with him. And, you know, in her pursuit of not wanting her half of the blame, um, her friends then said, well, that sounds like great. You didn't have sex with him, but he, you know, he had sex with you. He decided. And so that sounds like great. And then they pushed her to go to a sex therapist and she went along with it. Um, I guess spineless uh, behavior where she couldn't stand up to her friends and just let her shame and guilt take over. And then the worst part was this, which is. Yale's administrators, uh, there's a specific person, uh, uh, she's a, text, a sex therapist, um, excuse me. She then said, oh, this totally sounds like rape. You have been raped and immediately from, you know, uh, halfway in the session, uh, just calls Yale administrators and Yale police and tells her as an official from Yale, you must now go to this person and tell him this thing. You must now go over here. And so it was then Yale who took over and the entire bureaucratic, the, the, the Kafkaesque machination just went into high gear. Um, that year, this was a Halloween thing, October 26, 2015 is when they promulgated, came out with new regulations. And I was their first guinea pig and it was easy to run them on me. So this all uh, went down in 2015 given. or, or that was, right. wow. Okay. So it's been right. a few years. Quite a number of years. I've been going through this stupid nightmare for quite a long time. I actually told the New York times, um, Yale took away my twenties, but I'll give them my thirties. Uh, I'm cognizant of how long this lawsuit can take as it makes its way through the court system, but I will fight this till the bitter end. And so, uh, how did you pay uh, for your defense with the initial charge? So, 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 so the initial stuff, um, I was looking at a hundred thousand dollar in uh, bail. I was looking at, you know, just, I was a neuroscience kid at that point. I didn't know law. And so I was like Googling, you know, the abstract stuff of like, well, what is a lawyer? What is law? What is title nine? What is this? Uh, 
what is jail versus prison? How do you go to jail? You know, and what do you do if there's an arrest warrant? And so I'm just like Googling like a flurry of, of, of just questions. Um, so the way I paid for it, and this is where I am very proud of myself, is that by senior year, you know, I had been helping so many folks, uh, New Haven folks and just people that I had been helping, um, that I had made a huge contact list. And so uh, I went through my list. Helping how? I called what? Um, just people like they, they, they need a business consulting here and there, or, or I, I used to do student jobs, uh, at an office where, you know, they would, uh, folks would come in and reserve the space for stuff. And I would just, you know, help them set up, even though I didn't have to, I was like, you know, just helpful kid. And so, um, just lots of little things, um, or like there was an attorney who needed somebody to do translations from time to time. I was like, yep, I'll come show up. And so I would just do translations and so whatever I could, you know, help people with. And so, yeah, so I called some folks and said, Hey, I don't have a place to sleep tonight. And they're like, where are you? We'll come pick you up right now. And so, uh, and then other friends, you know, chip and, uh, a little bit here, uh, uh, other friends chipped over there. And so just that's how I've been fighting this entire thing for the past eight years. Do you even couch surfing this case is what you're saying? Yes. That's essentially what I've been doing. I, 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 funnily enough, I literally sleep in a couch. Mm, well, that's not funny. Um, I mean, I understand you the way you mean it, but yeah, that's, that's traumatic. So, so I, 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 I often use funny, mm -hmm. uh, as actually a mental defense mechanism. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I use that word, uh, uh I guess as a euphemism, uh, uh, to, to assuage my personal feelings because it, it hurts. And so uh, the, the, the trauma, as you pointed out, these things can go deep, but, uh, in order to somehow distance myself sure. from the fight, um, I, I, I cocoon myself mm -hmm. away and box away the, the game elsewhere so that I can then do it properly. True. Sure. I, I can, I can definitely see that. Um, I do wonder. If you look back at the time that it happened and what your views are on uh, promiscuity to an extreme degree, if they might have shifted over time or if that's something you would recommend for young men. Well, um, I mean, I, 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 I generally stay away from giving uh, folks advice. So I, people young men should you know i guess think for themselves and figure out what they want to do or not um i i, I mean i am cognizant of the uh, mathematics related to you know you sleep with a hundred there's a good chance that a few of those hundred will turn out crazy um and so forth um so i i'm cognizant of those things um and if the question largely is um have I grown wiser? I, I think I have. I think I've grown to be a better, smarter person. And there's clearly a lot of room to grow. Um, uh, uh, otherwise, I, I, I do appreciate the freedoms of America. And I do appreciate um, that the vast majority of people are actually good, nice people. Uh, and so uh, taking good precautions, of which... I guess monogamy and 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 you know just marriage and 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 so on and so forth are very good, appropriate, applicable strategies uh, to to not only avoid bad stuff and downsides, but in fact they can contain a lot of good positive effects as well. It's not merely about surviving and you know avoiding problems. It's also about creating and encouraging and enjoying the benefits of deep loving relationships. So, so uh, I readily admit those things. Okay. I'm, I'm just, you know, curious about that because it, it, a, a lot of your life is, uh, I'm not going to say you were unfairly, you know, you were fairly treated, but there is a degree of putting yourself in a vulnerable situation, um, by doing that. Right. And I always want to be cognizant of that. Yes. I mean, many stupid choices when I was younger, I would not necessarily, you know, repeat them if I could, but I just, you know, right. I always want to ask now where we are is that 
after the court said, you know, and jury said, you're not guilty, et cetera. Now, I did not know that you had all the publicity you had mentioned. Did they report on your acquittal and any errors they might have had? You said the New York Times, the Huffington Post, et cetera. Yeah. Did, did they um, print any kind of retraction or update? So, so they, they did little uh, retractions, like they added the word alleged later on, like after things would run through, they would call me a rapist, but then they would say alleged many days later. Um, but largely the, the crux of the, 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 the nucleus of the issue was they continuously challenged me for, oh, he got away with it. Basically saying not like uh, the funniest one was not, not guilty. Yeah. And so they were saying that, oh, the jury is old. The jury is sexist. The jury doesn't know what they're talking about. They don't know what uh, 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 grape is uh, like. Uh, and, and, um, the jury uh, is frankly just out of touch. And they, they said that the trial, which was extensive and thorough and focused on evidence, uh, the media reported it as such that, um, that I, the jury gave me the not guilty because my attorney said, well, why did she wear a cat, cat costume? when she could have worn a long flowing Cinderella gown. And as if that's what makes the win. And in fact, my attorney didn't say that in cross examinations is because he didn't question the girl on those things. He said something like that in the closing remarks. Uh, 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 and it was as a response to something that the prosecutor had said. But the overwhelming evidence was focused on just hard evidence, like the camera, like DNA and so on. And the jurors themselves told the media, anyone who would print it, a lot of the uh, mainstream media at that time, at the height of Me Too, refused to publish the sayings of the, the jurors. The jurors said that he's just innocent. We looked at the evidence. We kept, kept looking at the videos again and again. And he just didn't do it. He's innocent. And how long um, did it take him to yeah, um, come to their acquittal? Yeah, uh, about three hours. That's pretty and quick. I could hear them laughing about. It. Yeah, and and I could hear them laughing about an hour into it, um, uh, roaring laughter. And, and so, well, were you worried though? I knew. I was not. I mean, so I guess it's largely to do with my uh, set of philosophy. I I I I I love. Uh, Roman, uh, the, the five wise kings and, and, and Marcus Aurelius and stoicism and, and a bit of a lot of stoicism and, and a lot of Eastern philosophy as well. Uh, uh, an amalgam of various things that I've picked up from various religions and, you know, just ideas and my locus of control. I mean, like I did everything I could for trial mm -hmm. and when they were in the deliberation room, what am I going to do? There's nothing I could do. So. So I wasn't actually worried. There, there was a funny comparison between my attorney and I where he was worried. He, he, he uh, the junior attorney, he, he, he was biting his nails and I was like, and I was just playing chess on my phone. You had uh, two attorneys? Just killing time. Um, yeah, it's just Norm Pattis and Dan Irwin. Well, okay, and Norm Pattis is a heavy hitter. That's not a light one. How, how... Right. But now we're going to back up a little bit. How did you wind up with Norm Pattis um, as a college student dropout or kickout? I, I don't know how you put it. That's a that has to be a pretty heavy bill, right? So, so I I, I got him in 2015, and uh, uh, the he was not even recommended by anybody. Um, a ton of folks. Um, had recommended other folks who, who had better relationships with Yale. And the reason why I chose Norm, uh, I went to this other attorney. I don't want to uh, trash talk a specific guy, but um, so I won't be naming names. Uh, I go to this other attorney who everybody's speaking so highly of, and I, I get this gut feeling 
And it was a very strong gut feeling that if this attorney has two choices, on one hand, if he's 100% loyal to me and defending me, but he burns bridges with Yale, with the prosecution, with the judges and so on, or versus, you know, he's 95% loyal to me, but he maintains good relationships with those folks. He will choose the latter. And, and I didn't know to what extent that would go. And that to me is deeply important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't go with him and I've been following that attorney and other attorneys, um, uh, 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 over the years and they have performed badly. Um, they don't even speak their client's name properly. And the thing I love about Norm, I actually, by the way, I don't even know where you went to law school. I, I don't care about those things. A lot of people think that, oh, you should go to an attorney who's been to Yale mm -hmm. Law School, you should go to an attorney who's got the best perfect record. And I'm like, I don't care. I care about intelligence and loyalty. And there was a, a deep moment where uh, for I, I showed up to Norm Pattis's office one day and uh, I was waiting for him in the library. And I noticed on his table that he had several books and they clearly seem to have been read, you know, like a book that's unread in a the pages are not, you know, there's no gap between them. And they were related to title nine and, and what's going on on campus. Um, yeah. So here's an attorney who's dealing with a lot of felony cr crimes and, and, and that's his main thing, but he's taking the time out, very busy schedule to figure out, well, what's going on on campuses? Mm -hmm. And that's something I care about. Do you as a person put the time and effort into something? And so to ask, answer your question of like, how did I pull that off? I got a sweetheart deal. I got a really good deal. And I think a, a lot of America knows Norm heavily in the past three, four years. Uh, Alex Jones. J6 and, and Alex Jones and and, and other, uh, photos dulos and other, uh, stuff. Um, we've had this, I guess, uh, friendship and attorney client relationship for about eight years mm -hmm. now. And so, um, it's different, uh, uh, and, 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 and largely again, I, I, I get the bills paid for by friends and, um, I do have a give, send, go where people can chip in publicly, or if they want to chip in privately, uh, they're always, you know, free to message me. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a difficult journey. It's been an expensive journey, but it's all through the, uh, niceties of the American people. Okay. You know, and, and now your case, because it's not over and now we're moving on to a lawsuit, right? Because from what I understand. Yale said, you know what, we don't care about that jury. And much like the right. press, I was deliberately leaving Yale out because I wanted to save them. They, they right. made the determination that you got off, that you were, that you were right. guilty, but you got off. And right. through their own conclusion, they maintained your expulsion. Would that be how we'd put it or? Yeah. So, so, so. I, I was originally put on an emergency suspension for my safety and the safety of the campus. And then when they went through their, um, for lack of better phrase, their kangaroo court, um, they then determined that, uh, well, I still have violated, uh, the campus procedures and, and they expelled me on those grounds and that's when I, you know, took about a year to raise money, to, to conceptualize, go through the abstracts of like, well, I, I'm the aggrieved party. I've been harmed. How do I fight back? And so hence a year later, um, in 2019, December, I filed, uh, on a Friday the 13th as a spooky reference to both Halloween and, and, and to spooky allow like, well, here's a mm -hmm. lawsuit. Um, uh, filed a suit against the university, against 12 fish administrators and Jane Doe. Okay. And you're suing the, what on, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the suit would be. It's not a defamation. It's kind of a defamation, but it's. Right. So 
So I have I have about eight or so mm-hmm. claims. Um, against Jane Doe, it's defamation mm-hmm. plus tortuous interference uh, against, against my contract mm-hmm. with Yale. Um, uh, that that one is a c- conceptually fascinating to to uh, think through. Um, uh, against Yale, I have breach of contract and uh, Title IX violations and um, negligent uh, inflection of emotional distress and intentional inflection of emotional distress and a few other claims uh, that relate to like uh, warranty of fair dealing and just fairness and you know just wrongful treatment. Um, and so my claims against the university. Uh, Yale did not challenge them. They didn't file a motion to dismiss at mm-hmm. all, uh, whereas Jane Doe did file a motion to dismiss. Okay, and have you you've gotten past that motion, or because from what I understand, the state right, the state supreme court uh, got a hold of your case. Like somebody tried to toss it, and they upheld right. your claim. Or you, I, I need to get my wording right. I'm not a lawyer. They they upheld Darn. your right to sue because they felt like you were not giving a proper trial from Yale right. when they expelled you. Yeah. So so there was a fascinating uh, uh, path that I have taken through the American justice system. I mean, uh, I I got experience with the criminal courts. I got experience with the kangaroo courts and federal mm-hmm. courts and state courts. And so here's what happened. Uh, because of diversity of jurisdiction and uh, a few other reasons, um, I sued in federal court. So the District of Connecticut. Um, defamation is a state law claim. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I had sued in federal court. The federal district judge, she granted the motion to dismiss to Jane Doe, dismissing my claims on the grounds that Yale's procedures are quasi-judicial. They're just like regular court. Mm. And because they're just like regular court, she should get absolute immunity. Whether she has lied or not is irrelevant. She gets absolute immunity. Mm. And I appealed that to the Second Circuit. And the Second Circuit largely agreed with me, but they were unclear about certain aspects of state law. And they were like, well, how does the Connecticut law describe what is quasi-judicial? Where are the boundary? Uh, Because clearly some things are quasi-judicial, but other things are not. And uh, so they sent some questions to the Connecticut Supreme Court saying like, hey, is Yale's procedure quasi-judicial? And that's how the Connecticut Supreme Court said, Absolutely not. It's, it's, they, 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 they lack oath uh, requirements. They lack cross-examination. They lack a whole litany of things uh, that just, this is nowhere near uh, a, a judicial body. And so there's no chance in hell that they, I, I'm not quoting from being <laughs> the Connecticut Supreme Court judges are far more eloquent uh, than this. Um, they basically said that, Yale's procedures are not quasi-judicial, and thus there's no absolute immunity, and thus the girl is now back into the la- lawsuit. And so they sent the questions, the answers to the questions back to the Second Circuit, and we're waiting on the Second Circuit right now to come out with their final opinion. We know the direction that it's going to be reversed and remanded down to the district court. Um, the question right now is, how strong is the language going to be? And uh, as we have gone through these pr- processes where we go through appellate courts and their judicial opinions, um, which are more to do with the law rather than the facts of the case, um, they have significant precedential power uh, and effect across the nation. And so that's largely why the media is a buzz again, because inadvertently, uh, uh, or perhaps well planned and carefully calculated, um, my case is having significant cultural and judicial and just jurisprudential mm. effect across the nation. Okay, and um, one major question on the side note is why are you wearing a Yale sweatshirt? Um, 
I mean, overall, on balance, uh, I do love Yale. Look, they gave me food. They gave me housing. They gave me an education. And boy, did they give me a hell of an education after they kicked me out. Um, at the end of the day, I, 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 I'm not the type of guy who throws the baby out with the bathwater. I want to fix this American titan. Uh, there, there's probably a ton of folks in America who want to get rid of these institutions that have had these ideological captures. Um, they're infected and infested, but I would like to treat them. Now, the heavy dose of large settlements uh, might be one way, but there are quite a number of ways to disinfect and get our universities back to what they were supposed to do and designed for, which is teaching our kids uh, what is truly important rather than, you know, teaching their version of what an education means. And so perhaps I'm a naive optimist, but I do believe that Yale can get better. And so uh, I, I hope uh, uh, alumni, parents, and the general populace can uh, instead of giving up and you know, destroying it all, burning it to the ground, let's fix this country. I love this nation. I was born as a refugee, but I'm not going to seek a refuge away from America. I'm here to fight. Oh, so, uh, another uh, couple questions. Uh, did you ever finish your degree, not at Yale, but anywhere else? No. No. So largely, I would have to leave America and then come back in, to, and that's a no-go immigration-wise. So. Um, I mean, I also don't need the piece of paper, really. Why would you have to leave um, to I wake up, finish a degree? I'm, I'm, I came to America on an F1 student visa. I'm not an American citizen. I don't have a green card. I'm just patiently waiting for my immigration papers. I'm just waiting in line. And it's a very long line because I'm, I'm doing everything by the rules. And so it sucks because the people who are not following their rules, they get to the front of the line. And I, it bothers me. <laughs> That here I am just waiting, petitioning the United States government legally, uh, appropriately. So what is your status? I don't get the same treatment. So I have a pending uh, asylum application with the United States Center for Immigration Services. Okay. Okay. So how how are you living? I mean, do you have, do you have jobs, odd jobs? What, are you an Uber driver? I, 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 I don't have jobs. I don't have a driver's license. Um, uh, I've never driven a car in my life. Um, comes with the absurd territory of who I am. And I, 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 I don't live life in the way that most people do. Um, uh, I guess that's probably an understatement in some ways. Um, I'm, I'm largely just couch surfing. I've reduced my burn rate to a significant low where um, I don't spend much money. And so this is the most expensive hoodie I guess I own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wear it as as frequently as possible. Um, I, I guess in a zealot manner, I, I'm just dedicated to this fight. Um, to make an analogy, a metaphorical analogy, well, not metaphorical, sorry. It was a very real one uh, in 2009 when a young president of the United States, uh, Barack Obama, came onto the scene he had grandiose big goals, you know, he wanted to close Guantanamo Bay, he wanted health care, he wanted to defeat the Taliban. And uh, the Taliban responded to him saying, Mr. President, or did they say Mr. Obama? I forget. I think they said Mr. Obama. Mr. Obama, you may have the fancy watches, but we have the time. And uh, uh, not to say that... Uh, 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 I, I connect with that, but culturally, the, the you general, uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's known. I but mean, the, we're very short sighted in the States, but in much of the right. Middle East and Eastern world, it, it's the complete opposite. They plan it by generations right. versus. So that, that's, that's a fantastic way to put it. You're right. And so that's something I guess that Yale doesn't just does not get. Um, I will fight for this justice of mine till my last breath. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me how long it takes. I will sleep on a couch. I'll sleep on a street if I have to. Uh, I respect American law and the justice system and that the 
playground. I mean, this is not Afghanistan and uh, Afghanistan or elsewhere. The stupid and common solution is you just go shoot the person. And, you know, this, we don't live in the wild west in America anymore. Uh, we 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 don't do vigilante justice. We don't do you know uh, we don't take the law in our own hands. We we focus on you know proper guardrails and rules of like you know seeking out redress for one's grievances. And I'm telling Gail, like, look, I'm aggrieved. I am hurt. And I will do whatever I can to seek justice. So let's say you win. And so it doesn't matter how okay. long it takes. Let's say he win. Right. Then what? Yeah. So I'm also spending a lot of my time recently uh, in the past few years uh, helping a lot of kids across the nation. Mm -hmm. And so I call people, I text well, uh, I was on a call right before talking to you, uh, solving little problems here and there. Um, there are quite a few number of kids um, going through this process. They're no longer with us here on Earth. Um, mm. uh, and there are quite a number of kids who are permanently harmed. Um, I refuse to be hurt by you. I refuse to be hurt by the accusation. Have you thought about getting a it's law degree? I, everybody tells me to get a law degree. My own attorney keeps reminding me, saying, hey, just become a lawyer, you have uh, the knack for it, and so on. Um, I don't want to. Um, I, 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 I like living in my abstract world. Uh, I, I love the law, and I probably know a significant <laughs> chunk. Um, uh, not, not my calling. Uh, yeah, so I help quite a number of kids. And so to answer your question of what, what, do I do after I win? Well, there's quite a number of issues that I have realized that are, uh, that need fixing in America, uh, in, in the judicial system. And so, um, I have also learned how to have maximum leverage, you know, with the least amount of resources, how to affect the most amount of change. Um, while recently in the past few weeks, I have Twitter and, and I use Twitter. Um, I don't like shouting into the wind. I, I like to take concrete actions. And so um, I'm, I'm going to be largely focusing on fixing various parts of America. And hopefully I'm equipped with plenty of money to, to then effect that change on a nationwide scale. Um, I've already been uh, uh, successful, um, some accidentally, because what the Connecticut Supreme Court judges said uh, actually very much stops Biden's new regulations that he was planning to come out this October with uh, 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 the new Title IX regulations and they're dead on arrival. <laughs> and so uh, while I didn't choose to do that, I mean, like the Supreme Court judges just did that for me. Um, I'm now recognizing that um, I don't want to give up on this nation. And so uh, I love it here. Uh, what then implies I'll travel, I'll enjoy, I will, you know, spend myself in service, I guess. Okay. To wrap things up, I like to ask, what is the one question that I should have asked you, but I neglected to? Yeah, I think you've done a very thorough job. I, I've been blanking. I don't know what you could have asked. I mean, there's, you've hit some very salient points regarding the ingredients of personality. And, and I think, uh, this would be less of a question and I'll answer it directly as well. Uh, it's what does it take to win? And so, um, we've touched, danced around the subject, but at the end of the day, it takes a level of fanaticism. These institutions, they have immense power. They have such strength that the average Joe can't. So it does take, unfortunately, Scythe to beat Yale. And that sucks because that implies that very few people can get justice. And so that, that, that dismays me and it should bother a lot of other people that access to justice is unequal. And um, in these institutions, you know, it's... America, Yale is older than America. It, it doesn't have a life. It doesn't have emotions the same way a human does. And 
uh, it sucks. Uh, and uh, it's partially why I feel that great need to take on the responsibility as, you know, I guess I have to do this for others. It's a good final word. And thank you so much and good luck with your case.